Welcome to the Lipstick and Cowboy Boots podcast. I'm your host, Cassie Hausauer. Today's guest was involved in the sport of rodeo at a young age. He was on the board for the Box Springs Pro Rodeo and produced his first event of bull riding at Box Springs at the age of 15 years old. He rode steers and bulls, then followed in his father's footsteps and became a bullfighter, eventually retiring when he donated one of his kidneys to his mother. Shortly after, he became a rodeo admin for the Canadian Professional Rodeo Association. Since then, he has produced the Calgary Stampede, the Canadian Finals Rodeo, Salt Lake City Days of 47, along with several other original and award-winning productions like Bulls After Dark, the Grey Cup Rodeo, and most recently, Stampede's evening show, Ride Into the Night. As well, he is the Vice Chairman of the Association of Rodeo Committees and the Canadian Director for Safe Arena Footing. His newest endeavor may be one of the biggest, as he will be producing the American Rodeo in Arlington, Texas. He is married to his wonderful wife, Megan. Together, they have two beautiful daughters, Isla and Ophelia. Keenan Vine, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Cass. Where in the world are you today? I am in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, in the old stockyards. I'm actually staying in the stockyards hotel. So a little piece of history right now. I'd say. I wonder if anybody's been shot in there. Maybe in your own room. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's pretty rustic. It's nice, though. It's nice. I believe it. I've been watching too much of that 1883 show, so that's why that came to mind. <laughs> well, they probably rolled through here a time or two. I bet you. Uh, have you had any time to go fishing down there? Will you have any time? Oh, there's always time to go fishing. There's always time to go fishing. I don't know. Bass fishing around here, so we'll see. I, I just got in today, and uh, things are rolling here. They started with the... Um, tie down roping qualifiers yesterday and then the breakaway roping qualifiers start tomorrow and there's 500 breakaway ropers so it's going to go on for a few days and there's lots of qualifying that's going to happen in the next few days here yeah it's really exciting i see uh, logan bird made it in that's exciting i wonder lakota will be there tomorrow at the breakaway and a bunch of other canadians as well so that's awesome are you gonna head down to the breakaway roping or what's your schedule look like this week yeah, I'll I'll be around for some of it, and uh, you know, mostly just getting everything ready for the production side of things. And when we start with the semifinals in uh, here, and then move over to AT and T Stadium on the sixth. So, um, but I'm I'm here and and around for most of the qualifier portion of it for the next week here. Nice. So I want to know um, what all is involved as a producer of the rodeos that you've been a part of? Well, I mean, it can run the gamut for, from, from my side of things, you know, it can start from setting up the arena and, and putting down footing to, you know, securing the building and, and working on sponsorship and, and everything from that side of it. Or, you know, a lot of what I do is, is come in and, and actually just do the, the show pieces. So put together the production team, and when I say production team, I mean the, you know, the announcing staff and the music and the sound and pyrotechnics and, and those sorts of things. So, um, de you know, depending on the, the rodeo, I would say it depends on how much or how little I'm involved, but from, you know, the Calgary Stampede standpoint, managing it on a year round basis, it was, it was, you know, we put together everything from parking and security to, to, you know, who's going to be saying what on the the PA reads for the announcers. So, you know, it's, uh, I mean, that's quite a bit more involved than if you're just coming in to be a part of a production, you know, like say the Calgary or the Canadian finals rodeo and very specific roles that, that some of us played for a rodeo like that. Mm -hmm. Where did your passion for rodeo production come from? What made you want to be involved with that aspect of it? Well, yeah, you mentioned, you know, my family, my dad was one of the founding members of the Box Springs Rodeo. And so I grew up as a kid going to Box Springs and, and uh, putting that rodeo on and, and, you know, we'd be there for a month ahead of time. We'd whip in all the, around all the porta potties and, and get everything painted up and ready to go. And, um, you know, that was kind of where I got my start in, in that side of it. And, and I always just enjoyed kind of being behind the scenes and, and putting on the show and, and 
everything from the sponsorship side of it and working with the production personnel and the secretaries and the timers. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed that. So that was, you know, really where I got my start doing it. And, and I just always wanted to put on my own productions. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I started put on my own bull riding, put on a WPV bull riding, I think when I was 15 years old and, you know, I was going around up and down the streets, putting flyers under people's windshields and promoting it. And yeah, I just, I, I just always thought that was the fun side of the, the, you know, the industry. And, and now that's what I do for a living, but, and it's, uh, it's not all it's cracked up to be some days, that's for sure. But, um, that's kind of, you know, how I got into it and worked my way up. I, I, one of my first jobs, at the Pock Springs Rodeo was, you know, helping do the ground. So, was, you know, back in those days, we just get the cultivator and work mm-hmm. it up and then get the harrows out and harrow it and water it and you're good to go. But, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time doing that. And my family, my dad was in the oil patch and uh, we had a heavy equipment company. So, you know, I guess thinking back on, on it, that was always a big part of what we were a part of, you know, was, was preparing the, the arena and, uh, bringing all our equipment and our graders and everything. And, um, so that was, you know, that was from my earliest memories, we were working on the arena and getting the rodeo ready for box Springs. Talking about ground. Can you tell us a little bit about the safe arena footing that you're part of as a Canadian director and what all that is? Yeah, so SAFE is an organization that uh, was developed um, kind of in conjunction with the, the WPRA and Jimmy Monroe a number of years ago. And, and really, it's a group of industry experts um, from different, you know, uh, equine sports. And there's there's raining, jumping, all sorts of uh, uh, different sports that are involved, but a lot of it uh, came together around barrel racing and, and the group of people that would consult on and, and work with the committees on their ground. And, um, so a few years ago, Jimmy approached me and asked if I'd be interested in, and get in contact with the, the safe group and, um, work with them on the Canadian side of things. And just as timing would have it, it was COVID kind of hit. So, um, you know, we haven't done as much work as, as uh, in years past, but SAFE is really the group that, um, you know, kind of came on and, and got a lot of the good uh, rodeos in there, kind of advanced their footing and, and, you know, of what it is today. And so <clears throat> fortunate enough to, to get hooked up with that group and, um, you know, do some work with them and, and kind of adopt the best practices really is what they're uh, of what they've created for creating good rodeo arena footing. Yeah. And we've seen the Calgary stampede ground go from a little bit iffy, let's say to the last few years that we've seen Calgary, the ground has been amazing. Wenda Johnson's run 17 twos there. I think Haley ran a 16 there one year, like it's changed a lot over the years and for the better. So we appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah. And that's a lot of, I mean, I guess, you know, behind the scenes time and, and work that nobody ever gets to see. But, you know, even at the Stampede, we started, you know, when we started changing how we did the ground, we started, we'll bring a disker in, um, you know, and some of it's fairly rudimentary. Like people think it's super complicated and sometimes it's it's not. It's just, it's like building a road, right? You have to mm-hmm. work it up, water it, pack it, get it to where it needs to be and, and have it level set right so um good footing obviously starts with having it nice and and even and no holes and um so we bring in a you know bring in the disker disc it up and then start working it back down and and then pack it roll it and then work it back up to where we wanted it and the biggest thing at the stampede and and a lot of canadian rodeos that they don't have to deal with in the united states ever is that we also run on a racetrack. So the, the girls are, you know, um, I mean, not just, not just in the barrel race, but in, in any of the other events, they could be coming on and off a racetrack, uh, going to a hard surface to a soft surface in the infield. And so mm-hmm. my biggest goal is always just to make it even coming on and off the racetrack for the, for the truck wagon drivers. And, and of course, then for the rodeo and, 
if it's good for for rodeo and and we can make it even and then you know do mm-hmm. the ground for for the chuck wagons uh it's better that way than try to have you know essentially chuck wagon ground for rodeo is just not not possible so that was yeah, that's absolutely. a big undertaking to to switch over an arena especially dealing with weather um you know two mm-hmm. or three times in a day let alone you know over yeah. 10 days and i mean one year stampede we got 14 inches of rain in 10 days and we never had to cancel a day, you know? So um, yeah, this constant management is really all I can say about that. Well, you've done a great job of that, Keenan. We all appreciate it. Believe that. I also want to talk about you being the vice chairman of the association of rodeo committees. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Association of rodeo committees is a organization made up of, well, any rodeo committee, in uh, in the world can be a part of it and we do have rodeo committees from from all around the world that are members and uh, mainly it's it's you know some of the larger rodeos in north america are a part of it and that's kind of what it was created for was to be an organization and more of a, a a voice of of the rodeos to take back to the prca or the wpra or the the sanctioning bodies and and be that advocate for the rodeos so I've been the vice chair of that for a number of years now and, and sat on the board for probably five or six years. And uh, we, you know, fortunate enough to do a lot of good work and, um, you know, being that voice for the for the rodeo committees and the producers of rodeo and, and really trying to advocate for them, which the irony of that is that if it's good for the rodeo, it's going to end up being good for the rodeo contestants and everybody involved because really we're just trying to grow it and make it sustainable and, and keep it going. And, um, oftentimes it gets overlooked that it's not a cookie cutter situation for rodeo to rodeo can't all be the same and how we do our business. But at the end of the day, the good people involved really just want it to be better for everybody. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, let's get into the topic of the podcast, Teton Ridge. Can you just tell us a little bit about Teton Ridge? What is Teton Ridge? Yeah, so Teton Ridge is a company. Uh, Thomas Tall is is the owner of Teton Ridge. And um, I would say Teton Ridge is a company that is going to be involved, uh, is getting involved in the Western industry and Western lifestyle and on a number of fronts, uh, entertainment, sports aspects, and uh, you know, our main our main goal, our main vision is to uh, you know promote and preserve the Western lifestyle and uh, the heritage and traditions of of the Western lifestyle and the sports within it. So, mm-hmm. um, Teton Ridge is getting fairly heavily involved in uh, most of the disciplines of Western sports. You know, cutting, reining, working cow horse, barrel racing, team mm-hmm. roping, and of course, um, you know, they became the presenting sponsor of the national finals rodeo, and then purchased mm-hmm. the American. So, uh, on the sporting side, uh, also being involved in producing rodeos. Uh, uh, bought the better barrel racers and ultra team roping. So, Mm -hmm. you know, just getting involved in as many layers and aspects of, of the industry in that regard. And then also starting, uh, the TR nine ranch, which is a breeding and and training facility for Western performance horses. So it's a multifaceted approach definitely. And then on the other Mm -hmm. side of it, we have the, which is, which is Thomas Tall's background obviously is in entertainment so creating original Mm -hmm. tv series like guts to glory that is out right now that is the lead up to um you know the american and and all Mm -hmm. original content like that so it's exciting there's lots lots of cool stuff going on and and it's really um you know honored to be a part of this new initiative and new company that's coming into the western industry yeah what is your um new job title with them so I am, you know, producing the American, so director of production for the American and, and uh, you know, in the future, our sporting side of the, the industry and, and our company will be to produce uh, our live event sports. Cool. How excited are you about that? Just, the, you yeah. know, just producing the American rodeo, no big deal. 
Well, yeah, I, I always tell everybody, I'm like, it's funny, it's Canadian producing a, the American. Um, but yeah, it, it is exciting. And, and for me, you know, my, I guess, goals in, in the industry were always, obviously, the Calgary Stampede is, is you know, the biggest name in, in the Western industry. And and so to get to be the, the manager producer of that rodeo was, was a big goal, a big dream. And then um, never, never even really had it on my radar and until I got called for, you know, to come and work for Teton Ridge and, and to help with this rodeo. And so it's cool. It's cool to, to sit and think about some of the uh, events that I've got to be a part of and, and be a part of producing in, in rodeo. And uh, this one's going to be a really neat one when you go into AT&T Stadium. I mean, it's the, it's the pinnacle of uh, sporting you know, any, any sport to be in AT&T stadium. So it's going to be pretty cool to be in there on March 6th. That's for sure. No doubt. What kind of changes are we going to be seeing this year with the American rodeo or are there really any large changes? Uh, there's not, you know, not a lot of large changes. I would say um, a lot of the aspects of the rodeo were set into place kind of you know a year ahead of time especially with the money carrying over um from last year nobody won the million so now it's two million so <clears throat> the the qualifying system and everything has to say the same um we will be splitting out the go around so the uh contender go around or the the qualifiers where they meet with the invites will be on friday night in cowtown um here at the the fort worth coliseum mm -hmm. And then the top 10 from there will move over to AT&T on Sunday. So a little bit change in format. And, mm -hmm. and then, of course, we'll go from a 10 round to a four round with the uh, Tim McGraw and Faith Hill concert in between, kind of like a halftime show. So uh, a little bit, yeah. a little bit change up on, you know, the production and, and kind of how it's all laid out. But essentially, you know, the formatting of it is has been left the same for, for this year anyways. Awesome. Okay. Some question that we, we've seen it all already all over Facebook. Where can people watch it? Well, they can watch it a lot of places this year. So uh, it will, the preliminary rounds, the semifinal rounds will be um, on the Cowboy Channel. They will be mm -hmm. on Pluto on Ride Pass and, and then mm -hmm. leading into, and so all of those, uh, the semifinals one through three and the contender round on Friday. And then on Sunday, it will be uh, again on the Cowboy Channel and um, and Pluto for the, the 10 go round. And then on the championship mm -hmm. round, it will be that's our prime time live on INSP. So it'll be on um, kind of simulcast on several different platforms and broadcast on several different networks. So that also is exciting because uh, the rodeo is not just on one channel or another channel. It's on multiple channels on multiple uh, networks. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will just bring a broader audience to the, to the rodeo this year. Can you touch on why that's important? Cause I think a lot of times people want it to be just on one thing. Like everyone now we're so used to cowboy channel. We only want it to be on cowboy channel, but can you just, touch base and explain like why it's important to bring in a broader audience and to be able to showcase the sport and especially this this specific rodeo on more than just one platform yeah and i mean the american it's a unique platform it's a unique format it's exciting you know it's the richest one day rodeo uh three million dollars in prize money so it really is captivate captivating to maybe an audience that wouldn't necessarily be a hardcore uh, endemic audience for rodeo. So to be able to get it out on platforms where people might just happen to see it or would tune in and, and not otherwise be, you know, subscribed to a cowboy channel or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's really our opportunity to pull in those new fans and, and to broadcast it out to a, a larger demographic and get them interested in <clears throat> rodeos like, the American being in AT and T Stadium and having three million dollars are really a great, uh, you know. I would say the marketing side of things is great for for the sport and the industry in that way, 
and uh and, and it might get people that you know it's like they would watch the masters and they wouldn't otherwise be watching golf and the masters mm-hmm. is on the golf channel but it's also on nbc and ctv in canada or tsn and it needs to be on those other networks in order to get it to the broader audience so um you know much like the kentucky derby and and those other larger sports platforms so I, mm-hmm. I just related to that and say that it needs to go to a broader demographic and and you know I mean in turn you might also gain more viewership for a uh, subscription based channel like the Cowboy Channel when somebody says oh I really love this so I'm gonna get my subscription to the Cowboy Channel and watch the rest of the rodeos all year long so I think that it's you know I think it's good it's not it's definitely not a, a bad thing to have especially the larger rodeos um, on more than one broadcasting network. I agree. Absolutely. Um, What changes, if any, have there been with regards to animal rights and advocacy within the American rodeo and Teton Ridge, if any? Well, Teton Ridge, uh, you know, like I said, we're here to promote and preserve the Western uh, culture. And um, there will be some changes, you know, this year at the American some rules like the the no six second rule and the tie down and and disqualification for the jerk down and um, you know even some of the timing rules and and taking your stock and different things like that 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 truly do make a difference for for the welfare of the animals that uh, we have implemented for sure and and you know I think it's just important that um, that's always top of mind that's always top of mind for me when I produce an event is is the animals uh, care and safety and. Um, Mm -hmm. that's the first thing that I think about. And, and I think, you know, if, as long as the animals are taken care of, it's kind of like doing the ground, it doesn't matter. It's not about the barrel racing versus the tie down roping. Uh, it starts with safe ground. It starts with good, consistent ground because that's the foundation for the animals to be, you know, competing safely on. And, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. It's, you know, for us in the industry, we talk about animal welfare. Animal welfare is like providing the basic necessities for an animal to exist. For mm-hmm. us, it's should be animal care. We need to go above and beyond. We choose to use these animals for our livelihood, for our sport, for our entertainment. So it's our duty to, to go above and beyond minimum care provided. And so, you know, if, if any of those types of rules that could help benefit the animal and, and, uh, make it better for our viewer, then, then we're going to do it. You're cut out there for a minute, but you're back now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You just went off the, went it's off okay. The screen. Are we good again? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, I was just saying any, any rules that are going to be ben- beneficial to our animals and, and make it better for our guests and our viewer, then yeah, for sure. We're going to make look to endeavor to make those changes. Absolutely. And I think it is important. It is obviously important for the animals, but too, if we are bringing in a broader audience who might not understand things, we want it to seem like the best environment so that we don't have people like PETA on our backs. Right. So I think that's really Definitely. smart. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We know that we're, we we plan to attract an audience that, that doesn't necessarily understand or know a lot about rodeo. So mm-hmm. we have to present it to them in a way that they can relate to it and understand it. And, and, you know, Um, see that we are putting our best foot forward for the the industry and especially for the animals. For sure. Can you tell us about the athlete endorsements with Teton Ridge? Because some people have seen some things about it, but I don't think people really know what's going on with regards to that. Yeah. So Teton Ridge is, you know, building a team of athletes, um, you know, not necessarily just as a sponsor, but as a partner and a partner in their animals and a partner is with them as trainers. So we have it, um, you know, on the on the performance horse side. Like I said, you know, we have uh, um, Corey Cushing, uh, you know, as a trainer. And then on the other side, we have uh, you know Haley Kinsel and Lisa Lockhart, Sherry Servi, Brittany Posey. So it it's interesting, kind of uh, different approach to it and and not just a sponsorship, but it's more of a a partnership and a relationship with them and and their breeding and their expertise. And, you know, I think it's going to be a really interesting approach to it. And and I think it's going to have some really cool long-term effects on the industry. That's awesome. 
Um, do you know if Teton Ridge will be working on any events within Canada or what does their involvement within Canada look like for the future? I don't know yet. I, I don't know what the plans are. I mean, Teton Ridge definitely wants to be a global, uh, you know, have a global presence and be a global leader in the industry. So uh, that being said, I think that they're going to want to have involvement, you know, in, in anywhere where there is uh, Western sports. So Australia, Brazil, Canada, New Zealand, you know, wherever, wherever we can be involved. And, um, you know, I think it's just in its infancy right now, as far as the planning and, and where that's going to go. And, um, you know, for, for those of us that are involved, we're a very small company right now. There's, there's very few of us that are uh, employees of Teton Ridge. And, you know, it's been our main goal right now is to uh, produce the very best rodeo at the American. And, and of course, it's already started with our, with our preliminary rounds. Uh, but to produce that rodeo and then kind of get, you know, get out and, and start planning and, and looking forward from there. So um, I'm excited to see where it's going to go. I think it's, you know, uh, I mean, selfishly for, for me being from Canada, I hope I hope there is involvement in Canada for sure. Definitely. I think that wraps it up for my Teton Ridge questions. Do you have anything else to add or anything you wanted to tell people about Teton that we didn't already cover? No, I think we we covered it off. Like I said, I think it's uh, you know it's exciting for the industry um, to have fresh uh, fresh people involved and fresh faces and uh, people that are genuinely interested in in helping grow and sustain our culture and our uh, and our way of life. So um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm born and raised in it. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we're always, I think rodeo and especially, uh, is always the first to be skeptical of new people and new faces and, and what are they up to? But, um, you know, I've seen firsthand that this group of people is really genuinely, uh, you know, excited about helping and, and growing our industry. So, um, I'm excited to see where it's going to go. That's great. I love it. What does the future of rodeo look like to you? That's an interesting question. I, I think, you know, um, I say this, I've talked, you know, whether I'm talking with Ted and Wacy on cowboy shit or, or who I'm talking to, if I'm at speaking in front of a group of rodeo committees at a conference or what it is, um, you know, I think it, we have to be very honest in saying that we're at a crossroads probably right now with rodeo. We need, uh, you know, for sustainability, we need more participation. Uh, we have lots of participation okay. in the timed events. We have lots of participation in the barrel racing and the breakaway roping, which is awesome. Uh, but our mm -hmm. numbers, in the bareback riding and the bull riding, especially are, are not going in the same direction. And, um, okay. you know, those two events, especially we, we need the competitors in order to, to keep going. And so that would be my one side of things is saying, it's, you know, we got to do something. We got to big drastic changes need to be made and the entire industry as a whole needs to push in the same direction. And then on the other side of it, I see a lot of cool things that are happening and, and changing and, you know, bigger money and more opportunities for the breakaway ropers and for, you know, different groups within the industry. So um, it's like there's some kind of simultaneous things that are happening, but um, in order for the whole industry to grow, I think we got to, you know, you always kind of got to watch out the, uh, the side mirror and make sure everybody's coming along with you. So uh, we can't lose sight of that when, when we're talking about an industry growing and, and being sustainable, because at the end of the day, it takes all the events. And the irony of that is that all the other events have been saying for years and years, hey, we need to have all the events to sell tickets and people come to watch team roping, people come to watch all these events. So mm -hmm. we can't afford to have bareback riding or bull riding drop off uh, for, you know, lack of competitors because then we wouldn't mm -hmm. have a whole rodeo. So, um, you know, and and I think it's it's really amazing to see some of the advancements in even the competition and, and the, the competitive level of these young kids. So, um, you know, it just would be a dream to see, you know, some of these good young bareback riders like, Rocker Steiner and Cole Reiner and Leighton Berry, but to see 
two hundred of them instead of three, right? And uh, how do you propose thing. that we get more of them? Well, it's just, uh, I mean, rodeo has a recruitment issue. We don't do any recruiting, right? Um, other sports are going out and they're touching, um, you know, they're they're going out and asking kids to participate in football and baseball, basketball, soccer, and get them involved at a young age in a safe and, and you know, um, structured manner. And mm-hmm. in rodeo, we just don't have a uh, cohesive format for that and we don't have you know everybody's not doing the exact same thing that's based off of you know analytics and statistics and research to know that that's the best way to to do it and so somebody might say well mini bareback riding is the best way to get kids involved knowing nothing about what's the long-term effects of a six-year-old kid riding a 350 pound miniature horse you know like nobody knows what Mm -hmm. that's going to turn five years from now so Right. Um, you know, that's just the downfall of rodeo. We could have those analytics if we wanted to. It's just we don't have, um, you know, nobody's ever really endeavored to keep that central database and, and then work in one cohesive unit. And high school rodeo really has been the best system. And for mm-hmm. some reason, you know, we even kind of veer away from that just depending on the, the flavor of the week, right? So high school rodeo has been developing young people young talent in rodeo for you know nearly 100 years right or however Mm -hmm. many years 75 years i think it's been around and um again we just have to concentrate just like other sports do you know basketball and football and baseball they really get behind their high school and college level sports but Mm -hmm. that would be that's what i'm a big advocate for even on the association of rodeo committees um you know i kind of beat the drum and say Hey, if we all just focused our energy on uh, high school rodeo and junior high school rodeo, I think we'd be a lot better off than everybody kind of picking and choosing and doing their own little thing, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, what are some changes that you personally have uh, done to rodeo that have had a positive outcome? I can name one, but I would like you to name it. <laughs> Which one? Which one? I don't know. I really liked the barrel racers going first. I think that was really smart for a lot of reasons. Yeah, I mean... Um, at Calgary I, and I, the Canadian Finals Rodeo, those are both pretty big events to start that off. Yeah, we and, you know, I mean, I can't lay claim to saying that that's the first place that I've ever done it or seen it done, but, um, you know, done it for years in um, Armstrong. Mm-hmm. I like start with the barrel race there, and um, one of the reasons is just because I had a hard time controlling the... Um, humidity and the the moisture in the ground and so i feel that it you know it, the barrel racing especially with the mechanism of uh, turning of the barrels i think just you need more moisture and more compaction underneath the horse's hooves so it's a lot easier to control the the moisture in the ground if you get them to go first and we can prep the ground and have it ready for them to go and you know again depending on the rodeo and where you're at, uh, the barrel racing is the most dependable event to be exciting and fast paced and click along and get you started on a really good note, you know, really high note. Everybody loves a barrel race. So, um, you know, if you start off with the bareback riding or another event and maybe only three guys show up or, you know, you got a bunch of buck offs or whatever it might be, uh, that's not exactly the bang you want to start with. So, you know, I just, said why don't we just start going with the barrel race first so that was you know i mean it worked out and and at the canadian finals i thought it was was really good and um great way to start the the rodeo and and then once you're you know kind of done with the barrel racing and and have it the barrels out of there and groom the arena then you can roll right on with the rodeo so it just keeps everything moving and and you know you can clip off pretty good production wise so yeah that that to me is is a easy change and it was a good change and it's Mm -hmm. again surprising sometimes how big of a deal so that uh is in rodeo but um yeah you know probably it's funny because i was talking with uh lane peterson's down here we got him judging the the rodeo down here for us and alan jordan and they ran um over 500 runs in the tie down roping yesterday and we implemented the three second tie rule like we have at the Calgary Stampede for, for the American. And they think that maybe potentially took about an hour and a half uh, of time off of 
the preliminary runs yesterday. And, um, you know, that rule I came up with uh, when I first started working at the Calgary Stampede because we were trying to figure out a way to deal with the seat in the saddle rule, which was to replace the no six seconds, but guys were running back to their horse and causing other issues like dragging the calves. And so Barry McGrath and I, you know, we watched a ton of video and, you know, consulted with tie down ropers, Mark Nugent and, and, you know, Shane Hanchy and different guys and, and, um, you know, and Len Lane Peterson and Eugene Claire and the judges, and came up with the average time of, of three seconds, which was the time that it takes to check the tie on the calves. And then the guys are back to their horse and they can get on and ride forward and untie them. And, um, you know, it, change, it changes everything in the tie down roping. It's easier on the calves. It's more mm-hmm. understandable for the audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're just tying them up and letting them go just like we would if we were doing it out in the pasture. And it makes it a roping and a tying contest, you know, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it's just better for everything, really. And so, you know, I said to Lane, I said, geez, I never thought that a legacy that I would leave as a calf roping rule, but, you know, I think it's a good rule. And, uh, you know, I'm a big advocate for it. And, and it doesn't really change the uh, competition other than mm-hmm. you can tie one down and, and, you know, go as fast as you can. And, um, you know, these guys liked it here yesterday and they ran over 500 calves. So I think that's, that's a, that's a neat change that, uh, hopefully will keep catching on. It's in the WCRA and obviously now at the American Calgary, Houston. So, you know, Salt Lake city, I think it's just gonna, hopefully it'll just keep going in that direction. I want to know Keenan, what has been your proudest moment producing all the events that you've done over the years, what is like, it can be, you know, you've done the Canadian finals rodeo, you've done the Calgary stampede. It doesn't have to be the specific event, but just like even one year of those events or one specific one, what is your proudest moment for yourself in your career? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I would probably jump to bulls after dark just because that was, you know, just something I, I had been thinking about and wanting to do and, and kind of dreaming up and then got to make it come to life. And it was an all original production. And, um, you know, I mean, nothing, nothing in it was really original, but how we put the show together was really, you know, quite original and, and just so, so well done. And, uh, the crew that we put together was just amazing and, and fortunate enough to win a few awards with the, with the show. Um, you know, but I, I would actually say, thinking about that question a little further, and you say, you know, proudest moment probably would be final Sunday, the Calgary Stampede. Like, I think it was 2016 or 17 when we had all that rain. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just I, I believe it was even in the barrel race. And there were, you know, beating times like at the bottom of the ground and, you know, making for a really good barrel race and a really good rodeo on final Sunday after we, you know, I mean, we had vac trucks in the arena and we were literally out there. I was out there at five in the morning with a squeegee Mm -hmm. pushing water down to the alleyway and, um, you know, to get through 10 days and then to have, you know, have them making times like they had made from the first day um you know to me that's just those are the kind of things that i'm most proud of is is to see the behind the scenes work that all the people do the the tractor driver to the guy that comes and squeezy squeegees off the the shoots and sprays them down to make them look good for the final performance like that's the kind of stuff that i'm most proud of is is to see the team come together and and put on a good show and you know millions of people get to see a a world-class rodeo no matter what yeah that's that's a great answer keenan i approve (laughs) (laughs) is there anything else that you wanted to add no i just you know i know that we're on lipstick and cowboy boots so it's a pretty specific demographic that 
probably tunes in, so I don't want to get like labeled as like the the barrel racing ground guy or anything, you know. So just, <laughs> just a guy over here producing rodeos. <laughs> okay, fine, whatever. That's fine. I'm, I won't also ask you what your favorite lip sticking brand of cowboy boots are either. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, favorite brand of cowboy boots? Sure, we can go with that one. Justin boots. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And best of luck to you. I hope you have so much fun producing the American. Yeah, it's going to be a good week.